So hi, um, thanks for coming to my Lunch and Learn uh, about anatomy in Harvard Medical School. Um, this is a, uh, a rehashing of a presentation I, of a paper I gave at the American Association of the History of Medicine in 2016. Uh, it's also um, sort of the, I gave this presentation during the easy, early days of what eventually became uh, my, one of my master's theses. Um, and again, on, uh, this was in, on the cadaver supply chain in Massachusetts in the 1898. Uh, Anatomy Act in Massachusetts. Um, before uh, I get moving, um, like my last presentation, this one has pictures of human remains in it. So if you do not want to see pictures of human remains, please take that into account. Um, thanks. I like to boast that the anatomical department of Harvard Medical School is ready to give an account of every body it receives. This is a common refrain of Harvard Medical School's Parkman Professor of Anatomy, Thomas Dwight, in 1898 and 1896. He made it during his presidential address at the annual meeting of the, American, of the Association of the American Anatomists in 1895. It was printed along the rest of, with the rest of that address entitled, Our Contribution to Civilization and to Science in the January 17th, 1896 edition of Science. It was reiterated by Dwight in his September 1st, 1896 article, Anatomy Laws versus Body Snatching, presented in The Forum, a popular symposium-based magazine. So affixed was the claim to Dwight's professional legacy that Thomas Harrington used it in his eulogizing an appreciation of Dr. Dwight, printed in the December 30th, 1911, The Sacred Heart Review. The aim of today's paper is to articulate the intellectual space and the legislative evolution that allowed Dwight to make this claim and to illustrate the modifications to anatomy law that he himself executed. Dwight's statement seems to run counter to what we perceive of the 19th century anatomy lab, and certainly the claim could be more public, creation, public relations than reality. Illegal body sourcing narratives are prominent in the history of the history of anatomy literature. Franklin Payne Mall's account that Johns Hopkins obtained 60% of its educational cadavers from outside or extra legal sources between 1893 and 1898 has a reoccurring pre presence in the literature. And both public and academic works have trouble resisting the dramatic and influential 1878 robbing of the grave of Ohioan John Scott Harrison the only man to be the son of and a father to a US president. However, beyond anatomically progressive Massachusetts, a legally sourced medical cadaver may not have been as rare as popularly perceived. In 1895, the, Ameri the Association of the American Anatomists Committee on the Collection and Preservation of Anatomical Material reported on a survey conducted regarding medical schools acquisitions and disposition of material, which was published in the same, same January 1896 science with Dwight's presidential address. That committee, which included Dwight, J.D. Bryant of Bellevue Hospital Medical College and J. Ewing Mears of Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery, sent out a circular letter to anatomy professors in 148 US medical schools, 25 foreign medical schools, and 25 medical journals in the US and abroad. Of 42 respondents, 37 stated that their labs were sourced wholly lawful or in part lawful. Two thirds were satisfied or fairly so satisfied with their anatomy acts and 50% believed that their anatomical supply was sufficient. This articulation of the national and international landscape adds validity to Dwight's assessment of his own lab. There can be little doubt how important the actuality of such a claim would be to Thomas Dwight. In his address at the 1906 dedication of the new Harvard Medical School campus in the Longwood area of Boston, he called John Collins Warren's 1831 lobbying for an unclaimed body law in Massachusetts, stating, this must rank as one of the greatest services which Harvard has rendered to civilization. Well, I'm not sure the rest of Harvard would agree or even Warren, who performed, performed the first public surgery under anesthesia and was critical in the founding of Massachusetts General Hospital, 
or the New England Journal of Medicine, it certainly conveys the depth of feeling, of Dwight's depth of feeling about the legislation. This emotion and focus might be doubly important to Dwight as Warren was his maternal grandfather. The act Dwight was referring to is the February 28th, 1831, an act more effectually to protect the sepulchers of the dead and to legalize the study of anatomy in certain cases. This law was the first to provide the unclaimed dead to medical school anatomy labs in the United States, setting aside the executed criminal laws that legally fueled the Harvard Medical School labs since its 1782 founding. The 1831 law is the beginning of the non-punitive legal cadaver supply chain in Massachusetts and the origin of Dwight's 1896 claim of an entirely legal anatomy lab. In 1815, John Collins Warren took over for his father, John Warren, as Harvard Medical School's professor of anatomy and surgery. This is the, this is the same, perhaps not entirely by accident, if you made John Collins Warren, that the, this is the same year that the Massachusetts legislature passes an act to protect the sepulchers of the dead, which provides for imprisonment of up to one year in jail and fines of up to $1,000 for those who disinter, remove, and conceal the buried dead. Beyond the deterrence to institutionalized grave robbing, the act makes it illegal for anatomists to possess the dead in Massachusetts, a reality the medical community immediately began to work to undermine legally. There's surviving, there surviving correspondence between 1814 and 1819 between John Collins Warren and Harvard College President Kirkland that demonstrates the moves that Warren begins to make to legalize his supply chain. He informs Kirkland of the embarrassments from being discovered disinterring a cadaver and his fears of anatomy riots. He worries that the poorly executed grave robbing by non-Harvard physicians was threatening the supply and advocates for maintaining the, the dissection fee structure to compensate for this increased personal risk. All of this suggests a man both comfortable with the necessities of disinterment, but unsatisfied with its execution. The correspondence also makes it clear that the anatomist, that this was not a completely clandestine operation and the lab's realities were well known to the university's highest office. Despite, the eight, despite this 1815 statute that makes attempts to normalize, John Collins makes attempts to normalize his illegal supply. He obtains subjects from New York City's dissection rooms, having bodies shipped to him in barrels at $25 per person. He pays undertakers to remove bodies pre-burial, switching their remains with logs to provide an approximate weight. The Burke and Hare murders are often credited with instigating the 1832 Wilburton Act that legalized dissection of the unclaimed dead in Britain. The 1878 disinterment of John Scott Harrison spurred the passage of Ohio's 1881 Anatomy Act. It may be that Massachusetts has a similar precipitating event, although one that more so motivated the phys physicians and less so the public. In November 1819, physician Thomas Sewell, an 1812 graduate of Harvard Medical School, was convicted of the disinterment of eight individuals in Tobacco Parish near Essex, Massachusetts. He was fined $800 and made to leave Essex. After that, the overall impact on Sewell appears to be quite minor. After his conviction, he reestablished himself in Washington, D.C., and was the founding professor of anatomy of the Medical Department of Columbia College, of Columbian College, now George Washington University, in March 1825. He wrote a well-respected 1841 tract on the pathology of drunkenness. Nor did the disinterment conviction appear to see Sewell's anatomiz anatomization of the dead, as well could be, not be expected by an anatomy professor. War Museum specimen 1212 is from Sewell's tenure at George Washington. The individual, possibly used as an anti as antiphrenological evidence, was donated by a medical school in 1857. The legacy of Sewell's is partially represented in the manuscript of section record by stating, of Washington, history unknown. The greater influence of the Sewell event may have been through Salem surgeon Abel Lawrence Pearson. 
Historian Frederick White believed that Pearson deserved the chief credit for the passage of the 1831 Massachusetts Anatomy Act, despite Thomas Dwight's refrain that the act was one of his maternal grandfather and Harvard's chief grandfathers and Harvard chief's contributions and Harvard's chief contributions to humanity. Pearson was only two years out of Harvard Medical School in 1818 and was active in the Salem Essex area of Massachusetts and would have been aware of the Sewell trials. On February 4th, 1829, Pearson begins the effort to legalize anatomy and the acquisition of unclaimed bodies in earnest by proposing that the Massachusetts Medical Society form a committee to lobby the state and the legislature. The committee took up the proposal and John Collins Warren and E. Alden joined Pearson on that committee to prepare a petition to the legislature to modify existing laws which operate to forbid the procuring of subjects for anatomical dissection. On June 3rd, that committee reported to the society that the time was upon them to present to the legislature with their petition, and a new committee of nine was appointed to take up the cause, including Warren, that had Pearson as the chair. A September 1st circular out of Salem, and most likely authored by Pearson, was signed by all of two of the nine mass medical committee members and distribu distributed. It was augmented and later published by Perkins and Mar Marvin of Boston, also in 1829, as an address to the community on the necessity of legalizing the study of anatomy by order of the Massachusetts Medical Society. Amongst other key points, the circular argued anatomical knowledge is absolutely necessary. This knowledge can only be acquired by human dissection. This knowledge gained, the knowledge gained through dissection benefits the poor above all others. Society must prevent the growth of the resurrection industry. And resurrection was a sort of euphemism for grave robbing. To this original circular, the published version included, and the published version proposed the use of the unclaimed dead who must be buried at the public expense, arguing that by definition, the unclaimed have no family or friends who would suffer from having their loved ones dissected. And it also advocates against the usage of executed prisoners in the lab stating that dissection, dissection harms the prisoners, families, and friends who have already been made to suffer through the actions of the executed. The Medical Society's committee ordered 10,000 copies to be printed of the pamphlet, and it was widely circulated in original form and copied into many newspapers. The 1829 committee claimed that it has gone into almost every family in our community and has been extensively read. By January 1830, a bill had been introduced, but it failed. It was referred to the committee that the legislature did not think it expedient to propose any alteration of the laws at the present time, because in a community like ours, it is necessary that laws should proceed from and be supported by public opinion. By the spring, that public opinion began to change, most likely the result of the Massachusetts Medical Society's campaign. On May 29, 1830, Massachusetts Governor Levi Lincoln appointed a legislative committee to report on the proposed law. On January 1, 1831, that committee made its report and submitted a bill to more effectually to protect the sepulchers of the dead and to legalize the study of anatomy in certain cases. The report, in discussing the consequences of grave robbing, it mentions the well-known case of a now eminent physician then of Essex County, clear evidence that the legacy of Sewell played into sculpting the bill. The committee also reported on an insufficient amount of cadavers supplied by the state gallows. Between 1800 and 1830, Massachusetts only executed 26 individuals and the federal courts only executed an additional 14. It was impossible that executions were meeting medical school's needs. On February 28, 1831, an act more effectually to protect the sepulchers of the dead and to legalize the study of anatomy in certain cases was signed by the governor. This was the first anatomy act in the United States that moved medical cadaver acquisition away from criminals and the illegally disinterred and onto the unclaimed dead in custody of the state. It permitted the Massachusetts Board of Health to surrender individuals being buried at the public expense to licensed physicians 
to be used anatomically within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, accepting paupers, strangers, and travelers. The act made grave robbing a felony, increasing penalties, penalty maximums to two years in jail and to $2,000 in fines. Moreover, the act specifically stated that medical dissection was now legal within Massachusetts. There was some evidence of relatively quick public acceptance of the bill, a possible signal of the effectiveness of the Mass Medical Society's PR campaign. In an October 1831 editorial in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which eventually became the New England Journal of Medicine, a Dr. Isaac W. Mulliken recounted a tale of dissecting a man in broad daylight and getting his neighbors to help move and bury the anatomized remains. He declared, now, the people are almost unanimously of the opinion, at least in this region, that the law of last winter is a judicious and good one and seasonably enacted. The issue that Dwight felt that he had to rectify at the end of the century, though, was one that affected his grandfather's program as well. Accepting the period between 1855 and 1859, it was always optional for almshouses, almshouses to surrender the bodies and it was up to the discretion of the superintendents who are not, super, not always supportive. In his post-career reflections, John Collins Warren complained of the superintendent of the House of Industry in particular and marked, and remarked actually in a positive way on his 1847 death. In 1855, George Hayward opined that it may be an increase in pauperism and an increase in the population might alleviate some of their supply concerns. And as late as April 1896, Dwight was meeting with the overseers of the poor to inquire why so many bodies had not been given over to the medical school. After this meeting, Dwight reported back to then Harvard President Charles Eliot that it might be time to move forward with an act that was going to be mandatory. Dwight's addressing the optional surrender position most likely began with his appointment as all as Harvard Medical School's Parkman Professor of Anatomy in 1883, taking over for the venerable and beloved Oliver Wendell Holmes. Dwight was already at the school, teaching topographical anatomy, embryology, and histology starting in 1876. Dwight also served as surgeon to outpatients at the Boston City Hospital from 1877 and 1880, and was a visiting surgeon at Kearney Hospital from 1876 to 1883. But more or less, he put his surgical career aside when he became the Parkland professor at Harvard Medical School. A second critical insight into Dwight's character absolutely informed his, which absolutely informed his anatomical supply efforts and helped bring apart his, car, his later campaign of reform was his Catholicism. Dwight was a Catholic in a very Protestant Harvard community. His mother, John Collins Warren's daughter, Mary Collins Warren, converted to Catholicism with her sister, Miss Charles Lyman, at St. Mary's in Boston during a time of high anti-Catholic sentiment. Dwight's father also converted to Catholicism at the end of his life, despite being from a deep running Boston society family. Dwight's Catholicism was a fundamental part of his everyday life. Students remember his rosary peeking out of his pocket during lecture. In his memorial to Dwight, Thomas Harrington recalled, his ardent faith was his life and militant Catholicism was as real to him as militant patriotism was to his Warren ancestors. He wrote several tracts on reconciling Catholicism and silence and science, culminating in his 1911 Thoughts of a Catholic Anatomist, which received published sanction from the Boston Archdiocese. He was a dedicated member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which was a direct service charity to the poor and served as its president during its life. This ministry to the poor, which brought him great joy, would have without a doubt affected his relationship with the cadavers of the impoverished that entered his dissection lab. It was the St. Vincent de Paul Society that took charge of his funeral in 1911 and carried him to the grave. During his long struggle with fatal stomach cancer, he became the first president of Boston St. Luke's Guild, a Catholic physician group. The guild later sponsored a Catholic student group at Harvard Medical School named after Dwight. As if to punctuate the end of his Catholic life on earth, he requested his son, widow, and last non-nun daughter to join his other four daughters in the seminary, 
separating themselves from the secular world. Apparently, they complied. <clears throat> the lack of mandatory anatomy infrastructure turned out to not be the only precipitating event that prompted Dwight to challenge the current anatomy law. Harvard had been receiving subjects from the state almshouse at Tewksbury, founded in 1852 to care for all state paupers. But in 1883, this arrangement exploded into scandal. The charge was that the almshouse was selling bodies to schools like Harvard and even possibly hastening the residents' deaths, leading to an investigation led by then governor Benjamin Butler. At its most scandalous, there were acquisitions of giving morphine to babies and babies' bodies being exported to HMS and of bodies being thrown into a vault to be eaten by lobsters and eels. An investigative committee was established by the state, which Butler used as his political to his political advantage. He published test his published testimony was a dramatic indictment of the state's perceived relationship with Harvard anatomists. Governor Butler, in his testimony before the investigative committee, stated, they said also that there was never but one body at a time in that dead house. They swore that, two at most. I had two men here yesterday, entirely outside men, who said they saw dead bodies, 10 on the tables, and in the dead room, 12 to 20 more piled up like cordwood, higgly piggly, with dead infants between the adults' legs. Butler's accusations were supported by the testimony of, doc, testimony of Dr. John Dixwell, an 1873 graduate of the medical school. In his subpoenaed testimony, Dixwell stated that during the three years, his three years at Harvard, he saw and knew of several hundred bodies of infants each year being brought to the school for dissection. They were brought there in trunks in a county team and were deposited in a little anteroom on crates or shelves until the students were ready to use them. The Legislative Investigating Committee ultimately pronounced Butler's charges unsubstained and false, but the investigation still cast a problematic light on medical body acquisition. Tangible evidence of Dickwell's anatomical enthusiasm has been preserved in the Warren Anatomical Museum. Warren Museum 3795 and 7641 were prepared by John Dickwell in 1871. Their standard osteological preparations constructed for anatomical teaching and were included in the museum well before the Tewksbury investigation. The individuals represented most likely entered the school as, teach, as a teaching cadaver. The originally source is not mentioned. Student work is atypical in the museum's collection. And if nothing else, the specimen dedication to his, his dedication to his anatomical, to, to Dixwell's dedication to his, our testaments to Dixwell's dedication to his anatomical studies at Harvard. There is no doubt that the Tewksbury investigation influenced Dwight and fanned his desire to modify existing anatomy law and to build an ideal anatomy program as he envisioned it. In his previously mentioned works in, the, in 1895 and 1896, Dwight refers to the Tewksbury event, even if obliquely. In his 1895 presidential address in front of the Association of American Anatomists, he states, the cry of outrage on the poor is a sure card in the hand of the political demagogue, especially when it is raised against such an honored, some honored institution. And he further elaborated in his 1896 paper, Anatomy Laws versus Body Snatching, that many officials live in terror of the demagogue, which is truly pitiful. For the cry of desecration of the bodies of the poor is one of the tricks of his trade and officials may well hesitate to involve, them, involve themselves in difficulties for the sake of what to them is an abstract question. For the first quote, there is little doubt who the honored institution was. Even though Dwight publicly declared he could account for every cadaver in his dissection room in 1896, he believed he needed to further solidify the supply chain. And the only way to avoid the embarrassing situations like Tewksbury was to take the decision to surrender the body out of the hands of human beings. If the law was mandatory and there were no decisions to question or no politicians could make political hay out of them, and Dwight, excuse me, and Dwight, then no politicians could make political hay out of them. Dwight was sharp in his criticism of the Almshouse superintendents, and, uh, superintendents, believing them too cowardly to be of any use. Dwight sought out university sanction for his 
for his soon-to-be legislative effort and found a willing ally in Harvard president and educational reformer Charles Eliot. And in 1896, they began to correspond on Dwight's activities with the legislature. Like Warren's early conversations with President Kirkland regarding the anatomical supply, the Harvard president was taking great interest in the human dissection practices at Harvard Medical School. As he articulated to, to Eliot, Dwight's first concern was a new law that was passed in 1895 in support of medical examiners. That if it was interpreted, interpreted in a certain way by the opponents of legalized anatomy could restrict the medical faculty's access to cadavers as they were no longer, they were, they were being put off of a regulated list on who could receive remains. In this piece of April 1896 correspondence, Dwight essentially asks Eliot for his blessing to begin working on directly with the legislator to exi modify existing law. Dwight's initial attempts to alter law appear to have been unsuccessful, but he writes Eliot in December 1897 for permission to try, given a positive development in a, the political, in a political, a positive development in the political situation. The father of an enthusiastic anatomy student named Gould was in the legislature and believed with the proper stewardship of a new bill, it could be made, it could make it through the House and the Senate. Well, encouraged, Dwight offered advice to Eliot that I think it would be best not to have introduced as distinctly a Harvard measure, but to let other schools work with us. They will claim their share anyway, the share being the share of cadavers. While not abundantly clear, Dwight of well, this may not have been abundantly clear at the time. Dwight have also been allude, probably alluding to Harvard's relationship in the Tewksbury scandal and its link uh, and its link to the school. In May thirty first, eighteen ninety eight, in a May thirty first, eighteen ninety eight letter to President Eliot, Dwight announced that it may interest you to know that the anatomical bill has been signed by the governor. That bill, which is essentially which was essentially written by Dwight. Makes, made it mandatory for the almshouses to surrender the unclaimed dead within three days to the medical schools. Further, the law provided that schools would only have to hold on to the remains for 14 days. Further, the law provides that schools would have to hold on to remains for 14 days from death and make them available for inspection. The four medical schools who signed the petition, Tufts Medical College, the Homeopathic Medical College, and the Boston College for Physicians and Surgeons and Harvard were sanctioned to participate in the new system. That homeopathic medical college uh, later became BU. All right. In the same letter, Dwight informs Eliot of those in the legislature whom Harvard most owed its thanks. In addition to the current, the current leader, E.A. Morrison, and former legislature, Major Gould, the, who was the father of that enthusiastic anatomy student, the, Dwight wanted that, wanted the school to thank the Catholic Church in the form of Vicar General Byrne and Father Sullivan of the Cathedral who helped shepherd through the legislation. Dwight's relationship with Boston Catholic leaders had a demonstrable impact on the passage of this bill, which was entitled in, in 1898, which is entitled An Act Relating to the Promotion of Anatomical Science. It is possible that only this rare ardent Catholic and Boston Brahmin together in the form of Dwight could have successfully promoted the passage of this mandatory act. The bill was a clear success for Dwight. In August 1899, he reported to Elliot that the freezer was quickly filling up. There were 100 cadavers in the vault which could hold up to 150, but only if they built extra frames. Despite this bounty, Dwight cautioned Elliot against cutting off funding for more cadavers, saying, I beg you to believe that the best way for the present and at all events is to pay. There is no better advertisement for a school than plenty of material, both for students and graduates. And he reminded Elliot, say, Elliot that he reminded Elliot saying the point that Elliot said that the point was to get subjects and the expense was secondary. However, more than likely due to its success, the Anatomy Act was once again put under stress. This time, however, it was not public pressures trying to stem the flow of the bodies, but other educational organizations trying to take advantage of Dwight's cadaver supply chain. 
The Boston Institute of Osteology had convinced the legislature to provide them with an allotment of un the unclaimed poor, to which Dwight referenced, by what hocus pocus they did this is not being known. For Dwight was not informed of their progress. However, this did not seem to haunt, halt Dwight's determination to get the law he wanted. And as he informed Eliot, the last anatomical law, which has done us so much good, I may say largely due to my efforts, I cannot be expected to sit still and see the good taken away. Dwight died in 1911 of a prolonged illness. He remained the Parkman professor until shortly before his death and was able to enjoy his new normalized efficient cadaver supply chain to the benefit of his anatomical scientific work and for the students in his lectures. As a series of receipts from funeral directors from 1816 to 1820, excuse me, 1916 to 1920 indicate the acquisition of the unclaimed re remained as in a routine nature after, after Dwight's death, leaving the trials of the Sewell and the Tewksbury investigation to history. The receipts are from two funeral directors who appear to be the middlemen in the almshouse to medical school pathway. Director Martin Pratt served the school through the bodies of the State Farm, the State Farm at Bridgewater, and Farmer and Sons facilitated the transfer of remains from the Tewksbury Almshouse to Harvard. The bills are explicitly for transportation, which probably included embalming and burial only. The remains themselves appeared to be without a monetary assignment. In my brief analysis of, these, of this receipt collection from Bridgewater, from the, from the, of this receipt collection, Bridgewater provided 125 subjects to the school between 1916 and 1920 at a total cost of $1,480. This was for transportation and embalming only, for which Pratt charged $12 a body. Tewksbury represented a more vibrant source. In that same period, 483 subjects were sent to the medical school through Farmer and Son at the cost of $3,475. For this service, Farmer charged $10 for transportation and embalming and an extra $5 for burial. These receipts were, for not, were not for just transport and burial alone. As seen here, MD Jones and company provided 50 burial markers at the cost of $36.50 in October 17, 1917. It's a clear demonstration that the, dis the dis dissected individuals were buried as the law required. And assuming they avoided specimen science in the museum, their remains were only loaned to science, as Dwight so recommended in 1896. This system was a far cry from John Collins Warren importing bodies from New York City in barrels at $25 a person 100 years prior. The individuals in the anatomy laboratory of clear provenance and the law requires their burial after use. To which Dwight, during his life, even provided religious, religious services if their faith was known. For Dwight, he was successful in these, his efforts to modify the anatomy law, anatomy law and certainly would have felt that, according, in, I'm quoting him here, all reasonable, obs, obs, all reasonable opposition was obviated. There is no wrong to the living, no insult to the dead, and the needs of science are met. The end. <laughs>